Well, thank you very much for attending the webinar. The topic today is mesh types and their proper usage inside a SOLIDWORKS simulation. And before we even get into meshing and mesh types and different types of geometry, I just wanted to cover real quick what SOLIDWORKS simulation is and what finite element analysis is. And the best picture I have of that is this uh, cantilever beam that's at the top here has a force on one end, a fixture on the other, and it's really a continuous problem. And we need to tell the software how to discretize that or break it up. And that is where the mesh comes into play and is part of the finite element analysis. And then from there, you know, all of your partial differential equations are solved for displacement, then strain, then stress. And we get some of those uh, wonderful engineering values out of the software to give us some, a feel for our design. And what we really want to uh, focus on today is really that that breaking up of the continuous problem and in, in meshing it and generating a mesh for it. So where we're going to go today is I want to talk a little bit about model interference. And just because, you know, over the years I've seen this topic come up several times in training or over support, and I just wanted to kind of clear that up before we even get into meshing. We have geometry classifications and appropriate mesh types. So SOLIDWORKS has a wide range of different features that we can we can generate in different types of geometry. Simulation looks at geometry in three different ways, and that's really what we're going to be covering in that section. And then once we learn about those three different ways and the three different mesh types, we're going to learn how to mix all of those together and any considerations that we have to take with that. And then finally, we just have a wrap-up where we're going to kind of sum everything up, uh, everything together, and then also, you know, hopefully answer some questions if you have any of those. So let's just go ahead and jump right into the model uh, interference. And, you know, a lot of times I have people call in and, you know, they say, we, we just can't get the model to mesh. We're having problems, you know, it's, it's giving, us, giving us fits. Well, generally, if you're dealing with an assembly, the very first thing, in, and it's just good housekeeping, to be aware of is to run an interference detection to make sure that there's no interference in the model. Because if you go ahead and you try to mesh that, you're going to end up with a warning like what you see here that at least two bodies have, are interfering. You know, we can't proceed with the mesh. We've got problems. One of the nice things, because simulation looks at an assembly and multi-body parts the exact same way. They're just bodies in space. 2019 offers um, interference detection on multi-body parts. You no longer have to save those into an assembly. So that's a nice new feature in 2019. But let's just go ahead and jump into SOLIDWORKS and take a look at what happens when there is interference. And again, I usually recommend checking for interference right from the very beginning. But let's say we go, jump into this model and we look and we've got several different parts here. And let's go ahead and just try to mesh it, see, see what we get from this. So you just simply right-click on the mesh folder and say create, and we should run into a warning. And sometimes this comes up um, and it says at least two bodies are interfering. Sometimes we just get this failed message and it failed at a certain location. And this is actually asking us, do we want to check for interference? I'm going to say yes. And what it's going to do is it's going to take us right into the interference detection. When I say calculate, what we're going to see here is we actually have four areas that we have interference in the model. And we obviously, this is a problem. The reason it's a problem is later when we start talking about the 3D mesh is trying to put elements over top of elements, and that's just a bad thing to have. The only time that you would want interference in the model is if we have a specific contact set called shrink fit. So if this was a pressed fit, and we know that this outer wall has to expand, the pin has to compress for these two to be pressed together, that's the only time interference is really allowed in a model. So I just wanted to cover that real quick, just some good housekeeping going into simulation, um, you know, that you can check before you even get into, even get into a study. So with that, let's go ahead and look at geometry classifications and appropriate mesh types. So there really are multiple different ways of creating geometry inside of SOLIDWORKS sweeps, lofts, sheet metal, weldments, and really all of those um, types of geometry that can be created, simulation looks at it and classifies it under three main categories. And the first category is bulky. And by bulky, I mean solid geometry, where the length, width, and height are very similar in size. 
So, you know, maybe the length is four inches, the height is five inches, and the width is eight inches, all very similar in size. The second classification that simulation looks at would be called thin geometry. And this is typically like sheet metal or panes of glass or maybe uh, cardboard, um, you know, the size of a cardboard box. The thickness of the geometry is much smaller than the length and the height of the geometry. And then the third classification is beams. These typically would be your weldments. So any constant cross-sectional area that is being swept or drawn along a certain length is considered to be a beam. These are the three main classifications that simulation looks at when we go to mesh a model. So let's focus just on the bulky geometry to start with. In the bulky geometry generates what we call as a 3D mesh. It's a tetrahedral mesh and it looks like what you see on the screen. So it's a, basically a pyramid. The entire pyramid is called an element. And then at the corners of that element are what we call nodes. And this is where the equations for displacement are actually calculated, stress and strain. There are two different element types when it comes to a solid mesh. Those are draft quality elements, which is what you see here, where it has corner nodes. And if we were to virtually push on the top of this pyramid and hold the base still, as that pyramid moves to the right, let's say, the edge is going to move in a linear fashion, right? The equation of that line would be y equals mx plus b. So the, the movement there is very linear. A high quality element adds what we call as mid side nodes. And if we were to do the same thing, hold the base but push the top, what we would see is we'd actually see some bending take place because as you add another nodal point or another point of calculation, we're actually turning that into a quadratic equation. So we get a better understanding of the displacement and what's happening in the cell. And you might ask yourself, well, why do we have draft quality then when we have high quality? Draft quality is for large models that you want to do a sanity check on. You want to make sure, hey, is everything kind of moving how I set it up? And then you run as high quality to get more accurate or better, better results out of that. So let's actually take a look at this bulky geometry or the solid, the solid mesh uh, in action. So this is that same model, but I actually have taken out the interference in this. So if we go to interference detection and I calculate this, we're going to see that there isn't any there. And that's important when you go to generate a mesh. And the reason being is if there was interference, SOLIDWORKS tries to generate uh, cells on each part. And where those parts contact each other, where those cells contact each other, is really they share edges and they share nodes. So if you imagine adjacent cells to the one that you see here, they would be sharing sides of those elements. So if you have interference, it can't share those sides and hence it gives you a fit when it goes to try to mesh. So in this case, if we look at the mesh that was generated here and I create this mesh, I'm just going to go ahead and select OK. I'm going to use all the default settings uh, you know, with SOLIDWORKS and one general rule of thumb when it comes to a solid mesh is for a high quality mesh, which is what we have here, we have at least one cell across a given thickness because it's that quadratic equation. If it was draft quality, we would want two cells across any given uh, thickness, the thinnest thickness in the model. To back up a second, where you specify high quality versus draft quality is right here under the mesher, and you can specify draft quality on high quality is on uh, by default. So if we look at a mesh quality plot, so if we take a look at this guy, what we're going to see is we're going to see a layout of the cells with 3D topology at this section. So what I'm attempting to show you here is how the mesh actually propagates through the part. It's very easy to see with just a simple mesh plot, if we show this, you know, how the geometry maps along the surface. But you can create a mesh quality plot just right clicking and just saying create mesh quality plot. And then with that, you can actually say mesh sectioning. So that's this guy right here. And what that allows you to do is see inside of the part. So as I drag this, we're actually seeing how those elements stack up as they go through the arm and they go through the pins. So it's a good indicator of how well the model is meshed towards the inside. 
What I wanted to attempt to show you is because this is solid geometry, because its length, width, and height are very similar, these solid elements make sense. They're going to give us a very good representation of what's going on in, in the model. So the next thing that we want to look at is the thin geometry. And with regards to the thin geometry, again, the thickness is a lot uh, less in size than the height in the length. And the element that is assigned by SOLIDWORKS when you specify thin geometry or when thin geometry is created is this triangular element and it's called a shell element. And this really resides on the surface of the geometry. And we have a draft quality that has the corner nodes, the same as the uh, solid element. And then we also have mid side nodes as well that indicate a high quality element. And again, we're going from a linear interpolation of the element to a quadratic interpolation. So if we come in here, I want to show you a couple different ways of getting to a thin uh, type of geometry. So I actually solved this one of two ways. I solved it as a solid with a very good representation of elements, and then I also solved it as a shell. And I want to show you the difference between the results. And I think you'll be very surprised that they're almost identical. And that's because SOLIDWORKS did a lot of work on getting these uh, how they should be. So let's look at the solid representation first. So if we kind of ignore the fact that this is very thin geometry and we want to proceed with this as a solid, you can see here in the tree we have a solid indicator. So we would have seen this on the previous model as well. It looks kind of like a, a block or a curved block with a green check on it there. If we look at the mesh of this guy, so the mesh that was created is a 3D mesh, and you can see I had to put a lot of cells on this to get a good representation of what's happening across the thickness of this part. And if we run the analysis and take a look at the results, what we're going to see is we're right around 0 0.0626 inches of displacement, and that maximum displacement is up here at the top. And if I go ahead and animate this guy, we can see uh, you know, that displacement moving. So we're holding it at the top. We're just applying a force to the side. Now, for a shell representation of this geometry, which is really the better way of doing it, I have a study set up. And one of the easiest ways of creating shell geometry or a shell mesh is to create your part as sheet metal. SOLIDWORKS automatically generates that geometry. And you can see that the indicator here now looks kind of like a bent a uh, piece of sheet metal, and that's indicating that, hey, this is going to be a shell mesh. The other thing that we have to give the software is the definition of the shell. And because this was done as, off, as sheet metal, we don't have to define the thickness. Now I'm going to show you another example of manually defining the shell, and with that we will have to give the software a, a given thickness for the part. But if it's sheet metal, that all carries over right from your SOLIDWORKS model, so you're not worried about anything there. If we look at the mesh for this, it's going to look very different than the solid mesh that we just looked at for the exact same part. And if I zoom in here, what you can see is the force is being applied to a face, but the mesh itself is actually at the midplane. If you can see there, if I zoom in, it kind of gives you the highlight of it. So if it's sheet metal, SOLIDWORKS automatically recognizes that it should be thin, a thin formulization for the mesh, and generates this very thin mesh at the membrane of the geometry. Now if we take a look at the results and I look at my displacement, 0 0.062, before it was 0 0.0626. So we're kind of splitting hairs at the 10,000th decimal place there of you know our accuracy. But we're getting very good results either way. And this one took a fraction of the time to run. And if it was a very large model, this would run drastically faster because we're dropping the number number of nodes and calculation points between the two models. Just to kind of give you a feel for that, if we look at the details of this mesh for the shell, we are at 12,746 nodes. So those are 12,426 places that the calculation is taking place. If we do the same thing for the solid mesh, we are at 40,361. So that's three times, uh, well, two and a half times more nodes for the solid mesh, it's going to take a lot longer to run. So the shell mesh is a very beneficial option for things like sheet metal where your geometry is very thin.
And just to kind of give you a feel here, we can actually show the results in a 3D shell so we can kind of see it in both ways. So we can see the top plane, the mid plane, and the outer. So we can we can give you that kind of 3D feel with the results without having to go directly there. Now that was an example of generating the shell from sheet metal. This automatically does it for us. But in this case, we have a kitchen faucet. So it's a series of revolves and sweeps to kind of generate this geometry. Then a shell was used to kind of hollow it out. Well, what we want to do with this is we want to shell mesh it. And if we look, trying to put a couple elements across this thickness across the entire part would be very hard to do. Not hard to do, we would be able to mesh it just fine, but it would take a long time to run, and it's really not necessary when we can define a shell by this. If we look, this is solid geometry. It wasn't created as sheet metal, but what we can do is simply right-click on the geometry and choose Shell Manager. And when we choose uh, Shell Manager, it puts us into a uh, table down at the bottom. And we can go in and we can actually pick faces and define shells by those faces. Or if we want to define the entire geometry all at once to be the same thickness, we can say define shell by selected faces. I'm actually going to right click and select tangency. So it picks up all of the faces on the outside. And then I'm going to give this a thickness. And this is where I'm defining my thickness. Now the only other thing to keep in mind with this is when we zoom in, we want to make sure that we're picking the appropriate thickness. So what you see there is actually my geometry it's saying is going towards the inside of the part, which is exactly how we wanted to set it up. And when I say OK, what you can see is the icon looks a little bit different. It looks kind of like a sheet of paper, but that's indicating that this is now going to be a shell mesh. And if I go to create the mesh on this, what you're going to see is it generates the mesh as that very thin surface or a shell. So what would take a very long time to run if we pack solid elements through this entire faucet takes less time to run, less time to mesh, but we're getting very accurate results with regards to it. So that's an example or two examples of the shell uh, mesh. And then lastly, we had the beam geometry. And for the beam geometry, we're really looking at a constant cross section that is swept along a given path. And the element for that is really just a node that lies along the neutral axis of the beam. In this case, for the I-beam, it would be dead center along that beam. And really, those nodes are just held together by edges of the element. When you get inside of simulation, though, it's actually represented or visually shown as a cylinder. And the reason being is it would be very hard to show just a, a mathematical point uh, for that element. So it's actually shown as a cylinder. So let's look at an, an example of a beam uh, mesh. So beams are automatically created when you generate a weldment. So any geometry that is a constant cross-section that is swept will actually go through and generate when you get inside a simulation as a weldment. And there's a couple things that we have to take into consideration for this. First one is my icons now look like I-beams. So that's an indicator that these are a beam uh, mesh or going to be a beam mesh. The other uh, thing to take in mind or keep in mind are the joints. So the joints are where the beams come together. So because the mesh is technically along the neutral axis, and we can display that here. So if we zoom in here, we can see the neutral axis. The beams are, or the beam elements are along that neutral axis. The joints tell the software where the geometry comes together. So anywhere that you have the circles, let's edit this guy here. So anywhere that you have the pink spheres, that is a joint between multiple beams. So it's just that the, those two beams are coming together at this point. Anywhere that you have a gold sphere means that that beam terminates into nothing, basically. So it's just an indicator of where the end of a beam is or where the joint of that beam is. When you're dealing with beams, at any point you can come in here and edit the definition of that beam. And what it gives us is it gives us the ability at the ends of the beam where its joints are 
to do things like cause failure. So right now, by default, everything's rigid, it's held together, but we can certainly make it hinge or we can make it slide. Or if you choose manual, we can make it hinge in a given direction. And what this would kind of replicate would be if the geometry was maybe welded only three quarters of the way around instead of all the way or, you know, a weld broke and we wanted to see how the structure would move if that weld was broken. So we have the ability to go in there and change how those joints are kind of held together. The other thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with all beams is the fixtures. So your fixtures actually take place at the joints. So I'm picking and choosing the joints in this. So if we look here, we have a fixture up here at the top. We have another one over here where this is kind of held held in place, you know, in, in the air. Your loads when dealing with beams are applied either to the joints or they are applied to the entire beam. And in this case, I have an 800 pound load that's pushing down on that beam itself. So that's really the only difference there. And if I go ahead and create the mesh for this guy, what we're going to see is it's going to look like those, those cylinders or those tubes. Now we certainly can go in, this was added um, several years back, but it's really nice that we can render the beam profile to kind of get a feel for what, what this is going to look like. So, you know, if you go to your boss and you say, hey, you know, I made this all out of square tube, but it's rendered as cylinders, he's going to say, no, that's round tube. So this kind of saves you from that. When we run this, the output is going to be a little bit different than what we're used to, at least outside of school. So instead of seeing von Mises stress like we're, we're typically uh, used to, what we're going to see are stresses like the upper axial and bending stress. Or maybe we just want to see the axial stress. And in this case, we can see that. So SolidWorks simulation is actually doing the beam equations on beam elements. So we're getting that type of feedback back out of here. We can see displacement, right? We can animate this. So we get a good feel for what's happening displacement wise. And, you know, I wish I had this when I was in school, but we can also get, so for example, this beam here, we can get the shear and moment diagram specific to that beam or all the beams. So the feedback that we're getting is really geared towards structural mechanics and in the beam equations that we're, we're typically used to. So those are the different geometry types and the corresponding meshes that go with those. But in reality, we're not always just dealing with solid, we're not always just dealing with beam, and we're not always dealing with just shells. We're really working with a mixed bag of those. And what I want to kind of go through is mixed mesh considerations. So the example that we have here is a weldment frame. The, the feet are actually the solids, and then I have a sheet metal cover that's going to go on top of that. And if we look, some of the things that we need to look for here is interference plays a role. Even though it is a shell mesh, that virtual thickness may cause interference. Your weldments, if you did not trim those properly, can cause an interference that causes issues with the mesh as well. Other things to keep in mind with a mixed mesh are contacts, loads, and fixtures. And we're going to look at those uh, in, this, in this example model. So if we open up the example model, I'm going to go ahead and open up the study and we'll take a look at the parts folder in the study. And what we can see here is we have a wide range of different types. So we've got our solids, which are the feet here. We have our beams, so our beam elements. And in this part as well, or in this assembly as well, we have our sheet metal component that is the cover for this. So a couple things uh, that I did here, just to kind of give you a feel for it, is I added some context. Anytime that you have, anytime that you have a solid to a beam, you're going to want to add a bonded contact, and you can do that by the joint group itself. Anytime that you have a shell, not necessarily sheet metal, but a shell. To a beam, you have to define that contact by the face of the beam and then the actual beams themselves. So with regards to that, the rest is pretty straightforward. I put a 5,000 PSI load on here. I fixed the bottoms. And if we take a look at the mesh, what we're going to see is it's a mixed bag of all of those. So what we're going to get 
uh, when this shows is we see a shell mesh on the sheet metal. We see the beam mesh on the tubes, and then we see the solid mesh on the feet. And if we take a look at those results, if we look at displacement, because displacement is the same for every component, we're going to be able to see that animated for all the components. When we look at stress, the only difference here is the shells and the solids are going to generate vomesis stress that we can look at. The beams are going to show us just the beam, the axial um, bending stresses for, with regards to that. And here's the vomesis stress as well. So SOLIDWORKS really, SOLIDWORKS simulation looks at these individual components different in different ways. And really what it's doing is it's taking all that complex geometry that SOLIDWORKS can generate and it's breaking it up into the bulky or solid meshes, the thin geometry, which is a shell mesh, and the beams into a beam mesh. So when you're generating your geometry, kind of keep in mind, technically you can solve everything as a solid. It's just going to take a lot longer to run. The better way of doing it is maybe create a part, even if it's just a flat piece as sheet metal, because it automatically makes it as a shell mesh. Or if you're creating uh, you know, structural members, do them using weldments because it automatically creates those as a beam mesh. Also keep in mind the interference in a model uh, to start with, so kind of take care of that before you even start beginning to mesh it. And then, you know, when you're in a mixed mesh um, scenario, just keep in mind those contacts, loads, and fixtures, and you'll be all right. And most certainly, call in to support if you have any questions with regards to any of this. So I think that's everything. Robert, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. You got some really good feedback during the presentation. We have, what, 34 more of these to go. So feel free to hop onto the website, register for others, and we look forward to seeing you again. So thank you very much.